Chapter 41 of The Old Curiosity Shop This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Old Curiosity Shop by Charles Dickens Chapter 41 Kit made his way through the crowded streets, dividing the stream of people, dashing across the busy roadways, dividing into lanes and alleys, and stopping or turning aside for nothing, until he came in front of the old curiosity shop, when he came to a stand, partly from habit, and partly from being out of breath. It was a gloomy autumn evening, and he thought the old place had never looked so dismal as in its dreary twilight. The window was broken, the rusty sashes rattling in their frames, the deserted house a dull barrier dividing the glaring lights and bustle of the street into two long lines and standing in the midst cold, dark and empty, presented a cheerless spectacle which mingled harshly with the bright prospects the boy had been building up for its late inmates, and came like a disappointment or misfortune. Kit would have had a good fire roaring up the empty chimneys, lights sparkling and shining through the windows, people moving briskly to and fro, voices in cheerful conversation, something in unison with the new hopes that were astir. He had not expected that the house would wear any different aspect, had known indeed that it could not, but coming upon it in the midst of eager thoughts and expectations, it checked the current in its flow and darkened it with a mournful shadow. Kit, however, fortunately for himself, was not learned enough or contemplative enough to be troubled with presages of evil afar off, and having no mental spectacles to assist his vision in this respect, saw nothing but the dull house which jarred uncomfortably upon his previous thoughts. So, almost wishing that he had not passed it, though hardly knowing why, he hurried on again, making up by his increased speed for the few moments he had lost. Now if she should be out, thought Kit, as he approached the poor dwelling of his mother, and I not able to find her, this impatient gentleman would be in a pretty taking, and sure enough there is no light, and the door's fast. Now, God forgive me for saying so, but if this is little Bethel's doing, I wish little Bethel was was farther off, said Kit, checking himself, and knocking at the door. A second knock brought no reply from within the house, but caused a woman over the way to look out and inquire who that was, wanting Mrs. Nubbles. May, said Kit, she's at, at Little Bethel, I suppose. Getting out the name of the obnoxious conventicle with some reluctance, and laying a spiteful emphasis upon the words, the neighbour nodded assent. "'Then pray tell me where it is,' said Kit, "'for I have come on a pressing matter, "'and must fetch her out even if she was in the pulpit.' It was not very easy to procure a direction to the fold in question, as none of the neighbours were of the flock that resorted thither, and few knew anything more of it than the name. At last a gossip of Mrs. Nubbles's, who had accompanied her to chapel on one or two occasions when a comfortable cup of tea had preceded her devotions, furnished the needful information which Kit had no sooner obtained than he started off again. Little Bethel might have been nearer, and might have been in a straighter road, though in that case the reverend gentleman who presided over its congregation would have lost his favourite allusion to the crooked ways by which it was approached, and which enabled him to liken it to paradise itself, in contradistinction to the parish church and the broad thoroughfare leading thereunto. Kit found it at last, after some trouble, and pausing at the door to take breath that he might enter with becoming decency, passed into the chapel. It was not badly named in one respect, being in truth a particularly little Bethel, a Bethel of the smallest dimensions, with a small number of small pews, and a small pulpit, in which a small gentleman, by trade a shoemaker, and by calling a divine, was delivering in a by no means small voice, 
a by no means small sermon, judging of its dimensions by the condition of his audience, which, if their gross amount were but small, comprised a still smaller number of hearers, as the majority were slumbering. Among these was Kit's mother, who, finding it matter of extreme difficulty to keep her eyes open after the fatigues of last night, and feeling their inclination to close strongly backed and seconded by the arguments of the preacher, had yielded to the drowsiness that overpowered her, and fallen asleep. Though not so soundly, but that she could from time to time utter a slight and almost inaudible groan, as if in recognition of the orator's doctrines. The baby in her arms was as fast asleep as she. And little Jacob, whose youth prevented him from recognizing in this prolonged spiritual nourishment anything half as interesting as oysters, was alternately very fast asleep and very wide awake, as his inclination to slumber, or his terror of being personally alluded to in the discourse, gained the mastery over him. And now I am here, thought Kit, gliding into the nearest empty pew, which was opposite his mother's, and on the other side of the little aisle. How am I ever to get at her or persuade her to come out? I might as well be twenty miles off. She'll never wake till it's all over, and there goes the clock again. If he would but leave off for a minute, or if they'd only sing... But there was little encouragement to believe that either event would happen for a couple of hours to come. The preacher went on telling them what he meant to convince them of before he had done. And it was clear that if he only kept to one half of his promises and forgot the other, he was good for that time at least. In his desperation and restlessness Kit cast his eyes about the chapel, and happening to let them fall upon a little seat in front of the clerk's desk, could scarcely believe them when they showed him Quilp. He rubbed them twice or thrice, but still they insisted that Quilp was there, and there indeed he was, sitting with his hands upon his knees, and his hat between them on a little wooden bracket, with the accustomed grin upon his dirty face, and his eyes fixed upon the ceiling. He certainly did not glance at Kit or at his mother, and appeared utterly unconscious of their presence. Still, Kit could not help feeling directly that the attention of the sly little fiend was fastened upon them, and upon nothing else. But astounded as he was by the apparition of the dwarf among the little Bethelites, and not free from a misgiving that it was the forerunner of some trouble or annoyance, he was compelled to subdue his wonder, and to take active measures for the withdrawal of his parent, as the evening was now creeping on, and the matter grew serious. Therefore, the next time little Jacob woke, Kit set himself to attract his wandering attention, and this not being a very difficult task, once sneeze effected it, he signed to him to rouse his mother. Ill luck would have it, however, that just then the preacher, in a forcible exposition of the head of his discourse, leaned over upon the pulpit desk so that very little more of him than his legs remained inside, and while he made vehement gestures with his right hand, and held on with his left, stared, or seemed to stare, straight into little Jacob's eyes, threatening him by his strained look and attitude, so it appeared to the child that if he so much as moved a muscle, he, the preacher, would be literally, and not figuratively, down upon him that instant. In this fearful state of things, distracted by the sudden appearance of Kit, and fascinated by the eyes of the preacher, the miserable Jacob sat bolt upright, wholly incapable of motion, strongly disposed to cry but afraid to do so, and returning his pastor's gaze until his infant eyes seemed starting from their sockets. If I must do it openly, I must thought Kit. With that, he walked softly out of his pew and into his mother's, and as Mr. Swiveller would have observed if he had been present, glared the baby without speaking a word. "'Hush, mother!' whispered Kit. "'Come along with me. I've got something to tell you.' "'Where am I?' said Mrs. Nubbles. 
in this blessed little Bethel, returned her son peevishly. Blessed indeed, cried Mrs. Nubbles, catching at the word. Oh, Christopher, how have I been edified this night? Yes, yes, I know, said Kit hastily. But come along, mother, everybody's looking at us. Don't make a noise, ring Jacob, that's right. Stay, Satan, stay, cried the preacher as Kit was moving off. The gentleman says you are to stay, Christopher, whispered his mother. Stay, Satan, stay, roared the preacher again. Tempt not the woman that doth incline her ear to thee, but hearken to the voice of him that calleth. He hath a lamb from the fold, cried the preacher, raising his voice still higher and pointing to the baby. He beareth off a lamb, a precious lamb, he goeth about like a wolf in the night season, and inveigleth the tender lambs. Kit was the best-tempered fellow in the world, but considering this strong language, and being somewhat excited by the circumstances in which he was placed, he faced round to the pulpit with the baby in his arms and replied aloud, No, I don't. He's my brother. He's my brother, cried the preacher. He isn't, said Kit indignantly. How can you say such a thing? And don't call me names, if you please. What harm have I done? I shouldn't have come to take him away unless I was obliged. You may depend upon that. And I wanted to do it very quiet, but you wouldn't let me. Now, you have the goodness to abuse Satan and them as much as you like, sir, and to let me alone, if you please. So saying, Kit marched out of the chapel, followed by his mother and little Jacob, and found himself in the open air, with an indistinct recollection of having seen the people wake up and look surprised, and of Quilp having remained throughout the interruption in his old attitude, without moving his eye from the ceiling, or appearing to take the smallest notice of anything that passed. "'Oh, Kit,' said his mother, with her handkerchief to her eyes, "'what have you done? I never can go there again, never!' I'm glad of it, mother. What was there in the little bit of pleasure you took last night that made it necessary for you to be low-spirited and sorrowful tonight? That's the way you do. If you are happy or merry ever, you come here to say, along with that chap, that you are sorry for it. More shame for you, mother. I was going to say... Hush, dear, said Mrs. Snubbles. You don't mean what you say, I know, but you are talking sinfulness. Don't I mean it? But I do mean it retorted Kit. I don't believe, mother, that harmless cheerfulness and good humour are thought greater sins in heaven than shirt collars are, and that those chaps are just about as right and sensible in putting down the one as in leaving off the other. That's my belief. But I won't say anything more about it, if you'll promise not to cry, that's all. And you take the baby that's a lighter weight and give me little Jacob. And as we go along, which we must do pretty quick, I can tell you the news I bring, which will surprise you a little, I can tell you. There, that's right. Now you look as if you'd never seen little Bethel in all your life, as I hope you never will again. And here's the baby. And little Jacob, you get atop of my back and catch hold of me tight round the neck. And whenever a little Bethel pass and calls your precious lamb or says your brother's one, you tell him it's the truest thing he's said for a twelfth month and that if he'd got a little more of the lamp himself, and less of the mint sauce, not being quite so sharp and sour over it, I should like him all the better. That's what you've got to say to him, Jacob. Talking on in this way, half in jest and half in earnest, and cheering up his mother, the children and himself, by the one simple process of determining to be in a good humour, Kit led them briskly forward and on the road home related what had passed at the notary's house, and the purpose with which he had intruded on the solemnities of little Bethel. His mother was not a little startled on learning what service was required of her, and presently fell into a confusion of ideas, of which the most prominent were, that it was a great honour and dignity to ride in a post-chaise, and that it was a moral impossibility to leave the children behind, but this objection, and a great many others, 
founded upon certain articles of dress being at the wash, and certain other articles having no existence in the wardrobe of Mrs. Nubbles, were overcome by Kit, who opposed to each and every of them the pleasure of recovering Nell, and the delight it would be to bring her back in triumph. "'There's only ten minutes now, mother,' said Kit when they reached home. "'There's a bandbox. Throw in what you want and we'll be off directly.' To tell how Kit then hustled into the box all sorts of things which could by no remote contingency be wanted, and how he left out everything likely to be of the smallest use, how a neighbour was persuaded to come and stop with the children, and how the children at first cried dismally, and then laughed heartily on being promised all kinds of impossible and unheard of toys, how Kit's mother wouldn't leave off kissing them, and how Kit couldn't make up his mind to be vexed with her for doing it, would take more time and room than we can spare. So, passing over all such matters, it is sufficient to say that within a few minutes after the two hours had expired, Kit and his mother arrived at the notary's door, where a post-chaise was already waiting. "'With four horses, I declare,' said Kit, quite aghast at the preparations." "'Well, you are going to do it, mother. "'Here she is, sir. "'Here is my mother. "'She's quite ready, sir.' "'That's well,' returned the gentleman. "'Now, don't be in a flutter, ma'am. "'You'll be taken great care of. "'Where's the box with the new clothing and necessaries for them?' "'Here it is,' said the notary. "'In with it, Christopher.' "'All right, sir,' replied Kit. "'Quite ready now, sir.' "'Then come along,' said the single gentleman. And thereupon he gave his arm to Kit's mother, handed her into the carriage as politely as you please, and took his seat beside her. Up went the steps, bang went the door, round whirled the wheels, and off they rattled, with Kit's mother hanging out at the window, waving a damp pocket handkerchief, and screaming out a great many messages to little Jacob and the baby, of which nobody heard a word. Kit stood in the middle of the road, and looked after them with tears in his eyes, not brought there by the departure he witnessed, but by the return to which he looked forward. They went away, he thought, on foot with nobody to speak to them or say a kind word at parting, and they'll come back drawn by four horses, with this rich gentleman for their friend, and all their troubles over. She'll forget that she taught me to write. Whatever Kit thought about after this took some time to think of, for he stood gazing up the lines of shining lamps long after the chaise had disappeared, and did not return into the house until the notary and Mr. Abel, who had themselves lingered outside till the sound of the wheels was no longer distinguishable, had several times wondered what could possibly detain him. End of chapter 41